If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. And we are making our way through the Gospel of Mark. And really in a relatively rare sequence, this is the fourth paragraph in a row that's really connected to what is all but one continuous story from the last paragraph in chapter 4 where Jesus crosses the sea in the storm. As soon as he gets to the other side, he's met uh, by this demon-possessed man. And then the death of the hogs and the turnaround of this man is accomplished. And it's the people who are grazing the hogs that go out and bear witness about Jesus. And now in the last paragraph on this sequence, we will find that it's Jesus sending the man who has changed out to bear witness for him, though the, the man actually had other ideas about what he would like to do. Uh, but we'll pick it up in verse uh, 18. So let's stand together. Uh, and as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by the demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we wish to be numbered among those who are trusting in you. For those who trust you, you tell us are as stable as Mount Zion itself, and that such people will never stumble, but they are set secure forever. As secure as the mountains that are around Jerusalem, so you yourself, personally, surround our lives like the mountains around Jerusalem, immovable, certain, sure, secure. And this will be the way it is with us forever. Lord, you don't allow the scepter of the wicked to be what reigns over the allotment of your people, the righteous. Lord, reminding us that we often live in environments where, politically speaking, the scepter of the wicked is very much in charge politically very much in charge internationally, very much in charge culturally. That is certainly the case where we live. But you tell us through the psalmist that we are not to be ruled by the scepter of the wicked ourselves, but to stand fast for you. 
and to live out lives of righteousness for you. For you have promised to do good to us as we carry out your will and do good. You have promised to do good to the extent that we seek to be among the upright in heart. And warn us that those around us that turn away under their own crookedness, that you lead them and leave them among a group of people who are practicing wickedness, iniquity, but you place your peace upon us as your people. So Lord, we ask that we would be reminded what it means to be your people, that that would be our testimony, that that would be our self-understanding, that that would shape the goal and the direction of our lives, that we would live as those who are becoming disciples, that we would live as a family of disciples, that we would seek to serve in this community and to make disciples in this community, and that we would be a part of sending disciples into the world. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that some had from our congregation to do just that, as Don mentioned, and to go down and take part with our sister church and the surrounding churches that they are connected with, bring back reports about both the encouragements as well as the tremendous challenges that are there and the discouragements. And Lord, we pray for them as they meet those challenges and discouragements and acknowledge the blessings that you have given them. And may we do the same here as we meet our own challenges and discouragements. May we also be faithful to recount our blessings and to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. The title for our this little paragraph is Testimony, and I hope you noticed that we opened our singing this morning with a really a musical testimony. That whole first song that we sang is and was really simply a word of testimony no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. It used to be one thing. Now I have become another thing, which of course is the centerpiece of these last three paragraphs that we've looked at, the first three paragraphs in Mark 5, is this man who was one thing. And then he meets Jesus and becomes something altogether different. Put me in mind, in 1971, we uh, took vacation to the Southwest, our family did, primarily uh, because my parents were starting to look into missions and the headquarters of their mission was in Flagstaff, Arizona. And about uh, an hour outside of Flagstaff, uh, our car started to uh, act up a little bit. And about a half hour outside of Flagstaff, it, it more or less uh, quit running altogether. And providentially, we, we sort of almost coasted right into a pretty nice campground. Um, uh, right along the highway there that was built along a stream. But of course, this is 1971, so there's no, there's no cell phones, there's no 
uh, phone at a campground. And, and my dad had this appointment in Flagstaff. And so, of course, he's a little uh, perturbed about the, this, can't let them know that he's not going to make that appointment. And, and the car is out, and, and so he's got the hood up on the car. And uh, my dad was a better mechanic than me, but not much. And so, I mean, it was kind of a useless gesture for him to open the hood and, uh, and stare into uh, the engine. But it was certainly providential that he did that. Because here comes this young guy from a uh, campsite over and asks my dad what the problem is. And he tells him that he doesn't know. Um, and he says, you mind if I take a look? And so this guy monkeys around with it a little bit and uh, tells my dad, oh, I think I know what your problem is. He said, I think, in fact, it's not that big a deal. He said, I'm pretty sure. He said, if we, he said, I think I could take you into Flagstaff right now. We could pick up some parts at a parts store. Uh, and by the time we get back, it'll be kind of dark, but um, tomorrow I could just fix it for you right here. Uh, and so that's what they did. That's what they did. And so that night they're, they're over at our campfire and, um, and my parents tell them, you know, about their looking into this mission that's headquartered in Flagstaff. And these two, they're in their 20s, but they, they just think this is the neatest thing they've ever heard about. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Because they're both, they're both brand new Christians themselves. Uh, and he shares at our campfire how somebody recommended him and gave him actually a copy of David Wilkerson's book, The Cross and the Switchblade. And he read it. Um, and started to look into Jesus because of the story in that book, David Wilkerson being this really discouraged Pentecostal pastor who can't sleep one night and he's up looking at Life magazine and he sees these pictures of the difficult conditions in inner city New York and starts driving into New York to look more about it, and of course, eventually that leads to the establishment of Teen Challenge. But his wife, his wife read the companion volume, uh, the most famous convert, early convert of David Wilkerson's in The Cross and the Switchblade, is a gang leader by the name of Nikki Cruz. And Nikki Cruz wrote a testimony autobiography as well. I called it Run, Baby, Run. And this guy's wife had come to spiritual interest by, by reading that when her husband recommended it to her. And she had come to faith. They each came to faith through reading a testimony book, David Wilkerson's testimony book, Nikki Cruz's testimony book. And there they are, sitting at our campsite, giving us their fairly remarkable testimony as this guy is so thrilled about fixing my dad's car. You know, when that car went bad, I was, you know, I'm 13 years old, and I don't really like the idea of our family going to the mission field. So you think this is a clear sign, you know. <laughs> this is a, you know, Dad, if you can't see this sign, the car just uh, supposed to be in Flagstaff to meet this guy, and the Lord knocks our car out. Uh, and so I think that's a pretty clear sign, you know, stay in Illinois uh, and be content with what you have. Uh, that was the clear message. But by the time that evening is finished, sitting around that campfire, I pretty much know I'm doomed. <laughs> oh, man. What are the chances? What are the chances that you meet up with people 
like this. Well, in our text for this morning, as I mentioned, the centerpiece of this thing is that Jesus is going to send this guy out to give his testimony. Um, and, the, and the road there is also, I think, filled with some pretty important insights, theological reflections that are very much worth making. And Mark means for us to make them. But the heart of the story is this guy is being told by Jesus to go out and give his testimony in the Decapolis, in the Decapolis, to his, uh, ESV has friends, we'll argue in a moment, I don't think that's the best uh, way to take that, probably more broad, his people, his people. Uh, I'd say our thesis for this morning this way, we are called to bear witness to Jesus within his calling for us. We are called to bear witness to Jesus within his calling for us. And everybody in this room has a calling that Jesus has given them, a place that he has sent you. Um, and, uh, and this guy's calling, as we'll see, is not the calling he wanted. He wanted another one. He meant to move in a different direction uh, than giving his testimony in the Decapolis. And it all starts with him uh, asking Jesus to grant him what he wants. So number one, the sanctified request. The sanctified request. Verse 18, and he was getting into the boat, that is, Jesus was getting into the boat, and the man who had been possessed of the demons begged him that he might come with him. Um, well, that's, that's a great purpose. I want to be a follower of yours, Jesus, from now on. I beg you, let me come with you, and I mean to follow you wherever you go. Now, that's a completely different attitude than this guy had when he first meets Jesus, right? Remember that from back in verse 7, Mark 5, 7. Here's what the first thing he says to Jesus is this. What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of God Most High? I adjure you, don't torment me. So initial attitude toward Jesus... What have you to do with me? And now things are completely different. And he begged him. He begs Jesus, that is, that he might be with him. Now remember, this, this attitude toward Jesus, even after the miracle, is very much a minority report in this community. Uh, after the, the herders went out and gave their testimony and people came back and they met Jesus, here's the attitude of the bulk of the community. Uh, verse 17, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region, get away from us. So the majority response is, Jesus, get out of here. This guy's response is, Jesus, I want to be with you. Exactly the opposite of the broader cultural response. Um, now this little term for begging is a verb that Mark uses through this whole section repeatedly over and over and over again, which is significant because of what you see happen particularly right here. Um, 
It's a, it's a word that has a broader meaning uh, of, of usage. It can mean begging, it can mean exhorting, it can mean all the way to comforting. So you have to figure out what it means by its context. In every single instance here, the context is crystal clear. It means, it means begging. And it is the very verb that the community uses. When they beg Jesus, to get out of the region. Why do they want him out of the region? Dead pigs. Dead pigs. They've heard enough of the testimony to know that though Jesus didn't directly kill the pigs, the, the death of the pigs is definitely related to something that Jesus did, namely allowing these demons to enter the pigs. And so now, they are urging Jesus to leave the region. And on the other hand, this guy is urging Jesus to allow him to come with him. Now, this majority response is pretty understandable. I mean, John Piper wrote an entire uh, book bearing this title quite a few years ago now. Disappointment with God. Disappointment with God. We all know what it's like to have disappointment with God. We all know what it's like to have disappointment with Jesus. There's a whole psalm that focuses on how that works. Psalm 73 first three quarters really almost two thirds at least of Psalm 73 right in the middle of it here's what the psalmist says and they say that is the, the majority of people majority of people the majority of Israelites for that matter how can God know is there knowledge in the most high behold these are the wicked always at ease they increase in riches all in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. This, this is people making a claim to godliness and what they notice is, okay, what does my godliness get me? Nothing. Nothing. But these godless Hollywood types got millions of dollars and fly around in jets. What kind of world is that? Does God have any idea what's going on down here? How can God know? And let all kinds of stuff like this take place. Well, that's the majority response in this community. Jesus comes here, we got 2,000 live hogs. He's here for a little while, we got 2,000 dead hogs. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. That's how they think. That's what they say. That's how they feel. But this guy, this guy is where the psalmist ends up in Psalm 73 beginning in verse 22. I was brutish and ignorant, he sure was. And I was a beast toward you, running around in the tombs, cutting himself, crying out. But now he knows, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. And I have made the Lord God my refuge. 
that I may tell of your works. This is precisely what this guy wants. Oh, Jesus, let me come with you. Why would you want to come with me? Because the nearness of God is my good. The nearness of Jesus is my good. If you're a believer, that's, that should be your response. That's your reaction. It's the nearness of Jesus is my good. And so here it is, begging that he might be with him. Secondly, the surprising refusal. And he did not permit them. He did not permit him. Jesus, can I be with you? No. No. Now this is where, this is where the repeated verb becomes so important. Because this is the same verb Think about this. This is the same verb the demons were using when they begged Jesus to allow them to enter the hogs. And they were begging him, send us into those hogs. So evil spirits are begging Jesus for a favor. Send us into those hogs. And he grants them the favor. This newly converted sanctified guy is begging Jesus to be allowed to go with him. And he says, no. What is that? That's crazy. And they, the demon called Legion, begged him, saying, send us into the pigs. Let us enter them. And so he gave them permission. And as he was getting out of the boat, the man who had been possessed by the demons begged him that he might go with him. He didn't permit him. Jesus makes no sense at all. Yes to the demons, no to the newly committed child of God. What kind of program is that? The Apostle Paul is famous for this line at the end of Romans 11 as to the nature of God. Romans eleven thirty three O oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And here's the key words. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. That's equally true of Jesus, right? The author of the epistle to the Hebrews tells us that Jesus is identical with the Father as to character and essence. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of the nature, of his nature. Jesus is exactly like God. So just as you can say of the Father, you can say of Jesus, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of Jesus. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. Why would Jesus grant this and not grant this? Makes no sense to us at all. And the answer of biblical wisdom is exactly, exactly. That's a really important thing to learn as a disciple that it doesn't make much difference whether something makes no sense to you at all. Lots of things that God does and will do will make no sense to you at all as he does them. 
That's why that great summary of wisdom that's given by Solomon in Proverbs 3 really is so important. So what are you supposed to do when things most make no sense at all? Oh, says Solomon, that's simple. That's really simple. Here's what you do, and you do this every time. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's what you do. That doesn't make sense, I know. So now what do I do? Now you trust in the Lord with all your heart. But I told you it doesn't make sense. And then he answers back, yes, I know you told me that. And I told you, don't lean on your own understanding. You don't try. You don't need to figure out everything that God is doing. You won't figure out everything. His ways are past finding out. Now, with this guy, this part of it's a little more simple, right? Because, yes, he refuses to let him come in the boat. He refuses to let him follow with him. But then he gives them, he gives them a very clear direction. Um, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Now, you know, that, that's, that's a perfectly legitimate translation in, in some ways in that you're going to supply something there because literally what Jesus says is this. He did not allow him, but he said to him, go into your house to those who are yours and announce to them whatever the Lord has done for you and showed him, showed mercy. So go to your house to those who are yours. Now, just contextually, I'm guessing this guy doesn't have a lot of friends, uh, right? I mean, he's been for who knows how long out running around in this graveyard like a maniac cutting himself with stones. He doesn't have a lot of friends, but he does have a home that he came from, and he does have a community that he came from. And what Jesus tells him, I think, is, and the uh, NESB, just your people. Uh, but people isn't there either. But I, that's, I mean, you got to put something there because you're not just going to say, go home uh, to your home uh, to those who are yours. Um, you got to figure out what, who are those who are yours. Well, as we'll see from the broader context, it seems to be his family, his town, and in fact, he's going to take it to be an entire region that he is identifiably from. But it's important to know that about God. His ways are past finding out. What's Jesus doing? I don't get it. You don't need to get it. See, the essence of spiritual wisdom, the disciples think this way. What you do is you trust in the Lord with all your heart. What you don't do is think that you have to figure out everything on your own. Because you won't figure it out. And you're warned. No, don't. Don't try to lean on your own understanding. It won't work. Thirdly, the specific mission, the specific mission. So go home to your friends, go home to your people, go home to yours, those who are yours, and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you. So go home to your people, to those who are yours, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Well, you can see that this, this, this guy is uh, um, a walking, talking candidate for testimony. Uh, Right? For those of you, some of you were at our um, congregational meeting after last 
Sunday night and, uh, and uh, Jeff made a, a reference uh, to school days and show and tell projects, right? So show and tell, show and tell, you know, which is a, uh, can turn into kind of a bragging thing he mentioned. But th this guy is the ultimate show and tell project, right? Uh, he's well known. This is the maniac that was running around, cutting himself with stones, uh, breaking the bonds, making himself a hazard, and now here he is, clothed, sane, and telling us a story of how he got clothed and sane, and Jesus is center to that story, like, whoa. He is a, he is just a living show and tell project of spiritual power, of the glory of God, of the strength of Jesus. He is all of that. He is all of that. Now in Mark's account, in Mark's account, there's something that's left ambiguous that's made really specific in, in Luke's parallel. So notice at the end of verse 19, he did not allow him, but he said to him, go into your house to those who are yours and announce to them whatever the Lord, whatever the Lord has done for you. How he showed you mercy. And he departed and he began to preach in the Decapolis whatever Jesus did for him. Well, is this, the, who's the Lord? Is it Jesus? Or is it God the Father? Well, you can't tell in Mark's, in Mark's account. But you can tell. You can tell in Luke's account, because Luke puts it this way. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away and proclaimed throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for you. Now what you can't tell in the English text, but is really prominent in the Greek text. In both of those little phrases, the phrases end with the name and a definite article on it. So the first phrase ends with God. And the second phrase ends with Jesus. And they're very parallel. They both got actually a definite article on them. Go tell them what the God has done for you. And he went and told them what the Jesus had done for him. New Testament scholar Joseph Fitzmaier says, and that's a very suggestive construction to the fact that he's hinting Jesus is God. Now this guy doesn't know that so much, but Luke is saying that. You see what this guy's testimony implies? It implies this. Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. He is one essence with the Father. He is a source of divine power in his own right. That's who he is. And that's this guy's mission. Go and bear testimony to all that God has done for you. How he showed you mercy. And of course he tells us this is what Jesus did. And the power of God worked through him. As so I say, Mark, or Luke is saying a little more than that even. A little more than that. Hinting. Of what John says specifically right in the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. This is, this is hinting in that same direction. Ha theos, ha Jesus, Same. Same. In some really important sense. Fourth and finally, we opened with the sanctified request. Now here's the sanctified obedience. 
And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. <laughs> Simple obedience is a beautiful thing, isn't it? It's a beautiful thing for all of us to notice. But since I'm going to uh, use an illustration from my childhood for the kids that are here, you just pay, you just pay attention. Think about this for a minute. If you're, if you're like, you know, somewhere under the sixth grade, you just think about this for a moment. What a beautiful thing obedience is and how rare uh, it is as our go-to response. I mentioned a number of times, you know, our house in Rockford, our, my bedroom was in the back uh, corner, and behind my bedroom there was a sort of a three-season porch on the second floor that we had made into a, a toy room. And, uh, and it was, you know, largely often just kind of left as a disaster area. Nobody saw it but me. My mom didn't have to look at it. Uh, but once in a while, just the knowledge that it was there would start to plague her. And so then she would go look at it, and that was the death nail for me. Once she actually saw it, then like, oh, okay. So then you need to clean that up. Well, you know, when I'm eight years old, I'm pretty busy. You know, it's like I just, I, I can't drop everything and just run into that toy room uh, and start cleaning. And so she'd let that go maybe for a, an entire day, you know, and then I, would, then I would come home from school, you know, and she would say, uh, well, I saw you didn't really get to the toy room yet, so here's the thing. I mean, you're not going anywhere until you do that. So you can either, like, sit here at a, at a chair in the kitchen, or you can go do that. But what you're not doing is you're not turning on the television, you're not going outside, you're not going to go see anybody, you're not doing anything. You're not doing anything but sitting on a kitchen chair until, well, of course, this is not fair. This is ridiculous. The other kids are going out. This is absurd. You know, and so I got to tell, oh, mom, come on. You know, I'm going to do it later. And that's fine, she says. That's fine. You just sit on the kitchen chair until later comes. And so what happens then? Well, you go clean it. You go clean it. You know what never happened once in my entire childhood? Not once. Not once. Did she say, you know, you really need to go clean that room. And I said, all right. <laughs> never happened. Never happened one time. And I love this woman. I owed everything to this woman. See, what a beautiful thing obedience is. You, get, you want to shock your mom? She, Would you go clean? Sure. Glad to. Love to do chores for you, mom. Love to do chores for you, dad. Love to do exactly what you say, Lord Jesus. That's what this guy does. You know, this was not his first choice. No, I want to come with you in the boat. No. 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 Go and give your testimony in the Decapolis. In verse 20, and he went away and began to proclaim it. There it is. He just does immediately exactly what he's told. It's an absolutely beautiful thing, right? Like, whoa. That's what he does. You say, wow. I don't think it's, oh, it's really impressive when you think about it in real life. It's really impressive. He goes and began to proclaim in the Decapolis. Now, the Decapolis is a whole region. And if you, if you 
Uh, if, if, if you had learned Greek at some point in your, in your life, you'd recognize it as a little, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a name, but it's a name that has a really specific sense to it. Uh, Deca is 10, Polis is city, 10 cities. 10 cities. See, there's a region. Most of it is southwest um, of, uh, southeast, I should say, of the, of the Sea of Galilee. But part of it cuts right under the Sea of Galilee and even goes off to the west of it. But this region, there's, there's 10 cities in it. There's 10 cities in it. And what this text tells us is, and this guy went on a 10-city tour of giving his testimony. He goes into the Decapolis, and he starts to give his testimony. Now, they knew a little bit about Jesus there already. Not a ton, but they knew some. That's why I had the text from Matthew read this morning. Uh, uh, Matthew 4, 24 and 25. And his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the sick and those afflicted with various diseases and pains and those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and the paralytics. And he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis. So these people had heard about Jesus' healing from this region, and they've come and they've found him in the past. And so, for at least some of them, when this guy shows up, you ever heard of Jesus? Oh yeah, we visited Judea. We visited Galilee earlier to see him. Well, he came over to the Decapolis and found me. You've heard of me. I'm the guy that was... Insane, running around naked, cutting myself with stones just off the east coast of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus changed me into sanity. And I'm here recommending him to you. Wow. Wow. He just goes and obeys. And he shares. Well, you know, that's the trouble. That's what we say. That's the trouble for me. I don't got much of a testimony. Should have been a gang member in New York City and killed some people. Then you got a good story. You know, that's a good story. But I don't, I don't have that. Now, some of you actually have a fair testimony, even measured along those lines. But... Every one of you who's actually born again, you have a remarkable testimony. If you think of it, and, and you ought to think of it, in New Testament terms. Because if you think of your story in New Testament terms, here's how Jesus has taught you to think of it, summarize it. John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes. Well, if you're a believer at all, that's, that's you. You heard the word and you believed. Truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes, him who sent me, has eternal life and doesn't come into judgment. But here's the key. He's passed from death into life. Do you think of yourself that way? You're a person who by the grace of God, by the power of God, by the ministry of Jesus, maybe by somebody else's testimony, you've passed from death into life. Spiritual death, eternal death into spirit-driven life, eternal life, that's your story. And Jesus asks us to share that. Share that story. How you pass from death into life. And you recommend him. And most people won't care. And some will. 
And that's how it goes. Most people in the capitalists did not come to know Christ as their Savior when he went out and did this. I'm not quite sure some did. Some did. And he obediently went out and he shared that testimony. And that's what disciples look like. They're, they're people Jesus can tell us what to do. He can tell us what to do even when we had other ideas initially. I wanted to do this. Jesus said, no, no, you do this. Oh, okay. And we do. And we're becoming disciples. And we become disciples by, by really acting out what we see here in this text as we watch one disciple take initial steps and they're beautiful steps. They're impressive steps. They're marvelous steps. They're not hard to understand. They're not hard to follow. Um, but as we know, they're not easily done. Not easily done. But there's no reason not to do them, really. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of having a, a text like the book of Mark to look at and watch by your spirit how you worked with converts who became disciples who went out and ministered in your name showing us the way to be converts who are becoming disciples who go out and minister in your name in the ways that you've sent us to do it. And we ask that you would just encourage us and strengthen us and bless us to the end of being this sort of obedient disciple who gets over the disappointments of the nature of your calling upon our lives and trusts you with all of our heart and obeys from the heart. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen.